Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Coffee and Football, presented by Rick Vavro and Austin Underground. I'm your host, Blake Monroe, where I'm joined this morning by Bobby Burton and Jerry Hamilton. Tell us where you're checking in from, what you're drinking, get your questions in. We'll get to as many of those as we can a little bit later in the show. But first, guys, the team takes the field again today for the almost the last practice. They got two left. Today will be one of those two. And then the players meeting with the media at 11. I tell you what, overcast skies again in Austin uh, today. Uh, it's been really humid the last couple of days, uh, and uh, they're going to go out to, uh, this morning. It starts at nine. Uh, there is the sat. Is that the Saturday? Uh, this is Saturday. That's yeah. Saturday's number. Look at that. A lot of rain scheduled in the forecast. Uh, up to seventy percent uh, around game around kickoff, guys. Uh, so we'll see. Uh, it's possible it skirts by, but. Uh, we'll see how it goes. But today, it's just humid uh, in Austin, uh, overcast. But this will be practice number 14. The Longhorns players will then, by the way, uh, show up uh, on uh, on Saturday morning. Uh, there'll they'll be a couple today at media day or at a media opportunity after practice. But there's going to be a signing for the players. Oh, boy, we got problems here. <laughs> um, signings for the players, uh, stuff like that on Saturday morning. Uh, don't miss it. Uh, I think that uh, this is a great time to come out, uh, support the Longhorns, check out what's going on. I know the rain will keep some people away, and that's understandable, uh, but it uh, should be fun for everybody. Yeah, so Augusta Horn, you're correct on that. I keep saying Athens. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I would say a lighter, not a physical practice today. Not expected to be a physical Hard-hitting practice today before spring game. Uh, so I think it's, uh, you know, one last practice here uh, for the Horns and uh, before the spring game. And, look, I, I I think the only people not excited about the spring game are probably the coaches. I think the players are jacked up. I think the fans are jacked up. Um, but uh, I think uh, I think the coaches are the only ones not jacked up about these spring games. I'll say that. <laughs> so if it got rained out, I'm not saying they'd be jumping up and down, but I'm not saying they'd be going, dang, either. You know, they can focus on recruiting that way. You exactly. know, they can focus on recruiting. Um, another thing I wanted to mention before we got going, uh, Letterman are starting to get in town too for the Letterman's reunion that starts tomorrow. But actually, Letterman allow, are allowed to go to practice today. Uh, then they have a golf turn, a little golf scramble on Friday morning. Uh, so a lot of guys coming back in. We wish them well on their travels back to back to Austin as well. And then they have a big. Uh, brouhaha on Saturday as well for them. Hope everybody is able to travel safely. By the way, again, once again, congratulations, Jay Dobbs. Uh, yeah. That and a, a special thank you to the 40 Acres Collection for hooking you up. We hope you enjoy your apparel. So, well, Jerry, you talked about being fired up. One thing fans are fired up about is the portal. Lots of names being thrown around, guys. What's the latest there? Well, a... a a big target for Texas uh, jumped in the portal yesterday, and that's Dominic Williams, the uh, zero tech tilt player out of TCU. Uh, what, if you were going down the list of top zero tech type of guys that could enter the portal, he'd have been top five. Um, he is originally from uh, that Mission Hills area, played at Bishop Alamany out in Southern SoCal, uh, signed with TCU out of high school. Visit, he camped at Texas. And there were some that wanted to offer him and some that they were just an in-between and coming out of high school on him because he's six foot and a half, uh, but is a tremendous football player at TCU. I mean, he's a, he's a future NFL player. Um, and Texas will, Texas will be all in on this one, guys. This is uh, one of the guys, this is one of the talent levels that Texas has been waiting on to jump in the portal at the defensive tackle position. Uh, he's scheduled to be at Oklahoma this weekend. And then I think he'll be at Texas after that. Um, and, some some people will kind of talk about USC. I'm not sure on that one, uh, but I, I think uh, I think Texas is right there in the fight. Oklahoma's right there in the fight, and uh, it's going to be a big boy recruitment. So uh, gird up your loins. But this is one of the guys that uh, Texas has been uh, waiting on, and he's very very good, and he would be a difference maker for this team. And then a portal visitor. This weekend, is that correct? Can we recap that for a second? Yeah, that's that's correct. Bill Norton uh, is, again, Zero Tech, a uh, shade player from Arizona, originally uh, is signed with Georgia, transferred to Arizona, played for Johnny Nansen, played next to Savea there, 
for the 10-win Wildcats last year. He is going to be in town this weekend for the spring game. I mean, I think Texas is the heavy favorite there for Bill Norton. He's originally uh, out of Christian Brothers High School in the Memphis area. Uh, so he's, uh, he's a guy that I think um, a lot of connections to with Texas, right, uh, with Johnny Nance and with Savea. Um, you know, some commonality there, you know, uh, being a student at Georgia, being a student at Texas. So I, I think there's some things working for Texas there. Uh, Bobby, I, and I think we, we're going to see more guys uh, jump in the portal from Texas. Yep. Yeah, it, it, there's no doubt. Right now, Texas has four guys uh, in the portal. Uh, it, Jamon Tapp announced yesterday, right after, I, or was it right when we were going off the air, I think, uh, uh, yesterday, uh, the defensive end, Edge, uh, from Donaldsonville, Louisiana. Uh, he joins now uh, Billy Walton uh, out of South Oak Cliff, uh, Peyton Kirkwood out of Orlando, uh, and, of course, uh, Samaj A. Burrell out of the Crowley, North Crowley. Uh, those four are in the portal. Uh, Texas now goes from 89, uh, the 89 scholarship number, down to 85, which is the NCAA limit. We still think there's two, three, four, maybe even as many as five uh, more Longhorns that we'll have. We'll see some attrition. Uh, we're hearing about a couple things this morning, Jerry and I talked about. Uh, but until something goes public, we're not going to, you know, break the news or anything like that on a young man. It's going to, it'll, it'll just play out. But the reality of it is, is that Texas has to, if they want to pick up a Dominic Williams, right, or a Bill Norton or anybody else in the portal, there's going to have to be more attrition on the team itself. Uh, and I think we're going to start to see a little bit of that transpire over the next 24, 48 hours, especially into Sunday uh, after the spring game. Hey yeah, for, for uh, Roger G., I don't think Dominic Williams will have to pay to get into the OU spring game like the fans. <laughs> <laughs> so while you're on that, Zane Petty said, did OU really charge for the spring game? I saw that, but I don't know if it's true. Sounds like they are. It would be a sooner thing to do. Um Maybe uh, or, or an Aggie thing to do. I, after all, it is on the Aggies' official football schedule, the spring game, because they, they get to chalk that up as a win, I guess. <laughs> and while we're on the subject of the portal, guys, Anthony Dias uh, says, what happened with Bear Alexander? Can y'all rehash that for folks as well? Well, yeah. So, I mean, one, you never know where Bear is going to be. The high school coaches, college coaches, you never knew. Um you know, he went to four high schools in four years and went signed with Georgia, transferred to USC. He, so he was working on a perfect six for six. Um, I, I actually think it's really good for the kid that he stayed somewhere uh, for two straight years. I mean, that that's going to matter. Uh, that's going to matter come NFL draft time for him. Uh, there's, I, I don't care what anybody says. When they go and do background on these players, they're – NFL is going to have a lot of questions of why you were in six places in six years and if you'd have transferred seven places in seven years. I mean, it just doesn't make any sense uh, for, for NFL teams that are going to want to invest in you. So I think for the kid, no matter what the reason for the decision, I think it's good that the kid's actually going to be in the same place two years in a row for the first time probably since junior high. He needs that. For sure. All right, y'all. Well, before we get into recruiting, let's go ahead and talk about one of today's sponsors, Austin Underground. Bobby, I'm going to let you start there. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Rick Vavro and his team at Austin Underground have been specializing in difficult underground commercial installations since 2004. The team's engineering background gives Austin Underground the ability to perform work other firms often consider too risky. Rick and his team offer an end-to-end -end uh, client experience, including seamless communication, budgeting, staffing, and top-notch trade partners. And most importantly, they produce solid quality work each and every time. That's Austin Underground. Rick and his team, uh, good guys there. They've been out to a couple of tailgates with us, uh, et cetera. Uh, just uh, solid overall guys. Love the Longhorns as well. I think he's got two different degrees uh, from the University of Texas in engineering. Uh, so he and his team have been in and around Austin uh, for 20-plus years now. Somebody asked about Simeon uh, Barrow, the defensive lineman out of Michigan State. Not a name I've heard. Um, I, I think look, Dominic Williams is a big, big name that went in the portal. And we'll see in the next three, four days who else jumps in. Well, Jerry, we're going to let you jump in before we get into recruiting and tell folks out there about Manscaped as well. Oh, my gosh. I mean, look, I'm on the road, but you know what that means? So's the 5.0s on the road with me, guys. 
Call them what you want, knee knockers, golden nuggets, eye slappers. But our friends at Manscaped prefer to them as the boys. Not every man has children, but every man is responsible for their two boys below the waist. And don't you forget it. When your little guys have more hair than they need, trust Manscaped for all your grooming dreams. Boys need love too. So join the 10 million men worldwide who trust Manscaped by going to manscaped.com and use code on Texas, all caps for 20% off plus free shipping. You heard it here first. The boys are back in town. <laughs> good stuff. Good stuff, guys. Well, some more good stuff we need to talk about is recruiting a lot going on. And Jerry, I'm going to let you take the lead and let everybody know what's what's happening. Yeah, so I think we have a graphic for the spring game visitors list. And, and just know that Blake's going to pull up. Just know that some of these guys, not everybody will make it in. A couple of these guys. So I talked to somebody near Kevin Wynn's recruitment, uh, the defensive lineman from Green County this morning. 50-50, whether he comes in. You know, if you're coming in from out of state, is that weather somewhat of an issue? Possibly, right? I mean, so we'll see there. Uh, Malik Autry. Uh, I would say that's a maybe until he shows up. Uh, those out-of-state guys, but there's a good chance some of those guys are going to make it in. Uh, Nick Brooks still scheduled to be in, the, a four-star offensive lineman from Cedar Rapids, JFK High. Um, obviously, a lot of people will be talking about K.J. Lacey and Keelan Russell. We hear um, we hear that uh, um, we, we hear all the questions coming in about is Texas going to offer Keelan Russell. We'll find out. I think the linebackers are interesting this weekend, right? Um, Riley Pettijan, Nasir Wyatt. Uh, Elijah Barnes obviously committed to Texas. We're going to re, kind of re, re talk about reset the linebacker position in a second. And then there's James Simon, the running back from Calvary Christian. Uh, interesting recruitment. Everybody thought that was headed to LSU. LSU took a second running back from in-state last weekend. JT Lindsay was really fast, by the way, out of Alexandria. Uh, so that really shifts James Simon's recruitment. Uh, we'll see what happens with him this morning. Uh, there's a couple of names not on that list as well. Jonathan Cunningham, the linebacker from North Crowley, will be coming in as well. And then Chase Sims, the defensive lineman from Richmond Randall. Obviously, Jonathan Cunningham has a June 14th through 16th official visit scheduled now. Uh, but Lance Jackson back on campus probably will be a five-star prospect when it's when it's all said and done. So the Texas visitors list, and this isn't the complete list, guys. John Turntine, the 26th. 2026 five-star out of North Crowley is scheduled to be in town as well. This visitors list is going to ha have more names than that. That's just what we could put up on the graphic. I expect, oh, I don't know, 17 to 20 four-star prospects or five-star prospects combined in the 25 and 26 classes on campus Saturday. It's, it's going to be a big recruiting weekend for the Longhorns. Um uh, somebody's asking about uh, Keati Armstrong. We'll see if he comes back this weekend. He was in town last weekend. Uh, so we'll, we'll, we'll see what happens if he comes actually comes back next weekend. I talked to somebody close to that recruitment yesterday. They said no plans to come in right now. I think Caleb Edwards, the tight end from uh, Oak Ridge there in El Dorado Hills, California, is interesting because this is one of the, his visit, Nick Brooks' visit. Uh, also, the D-lineman, Derry Norris from Spru Spruce Creek, and his father. I'm a big fan of Derry Norris's upside. He's coming in as well. So these first visits to Texas for some of these guys, I think, are so key uh, because I'll keep hitting on it. Like, Brandon Baker came in with his family for the spring game last year, and that recruitment really moved forward after that point. Uh, Caleb Edwards, a D, uh, tight end out of uh, California, first time. This will be his first time on campus. Uh, then he also has a June 7th through 9th official visit set up. Uh, Nick Brooks has official visit set up. Those D-line guys, this is kind of going to be their first visit to Austin. So then you'll see if Texas, who they set up for an official visit. This is a big weekend for Sark and his staff because they, they kind of take a look at this and say, okay, where are we going with these recruitments? We got them and their families on campus. Okay, now we have a feel for this. Are we spinning our wheels, wasting our time, or do we move forward with these recruitments? Does it make sense for both parties? Uh, so it's going to be a big weekend on the 40. The other guy not on that list is Kelshawn Johnson. Uh, Kelshawn Johnson, a four-star receiver, speedster out of Hitchcock. Uh, look, if he shows up this weekend that that on regional track meet weekend, that's saying a lot of him and his mom uh, make it in Saturday, which I, I kind of expect them to. 
Let, hey, Jerry, uh, give people uh, also Jackson Christian, the offensive lineman out of Port Natchez Groves, was in on Tuesday after being on, visiting on Saturday. Uh, what are you hearing in that regard as to his uh, recruitment right now? Uh, Texas, obviously, Texas A&M. It sounds like it's a one-two, a duel right now between uh, the Longhorns and Aggies. Yeah, I think that's where it's been headed for a while. I mean, Texas Tech's trying to get an official visit, but he's I think he's going to A&M Texas. I think it's a football academics combination recruitment. Uh, he's a blue-collar kid, tough football player, really good feet, good length, 82-inch wingspan. Uh, but I think it's coming down to an in-state battle. Um, and, and look, A&M needs to win some of these offensive line battles in this class. I'll say that. Uh, that That is a huge position and need for them. He's been on the Texas campus more than anywhere else uh, two times, by two times any other campus. Kyle Flood offered him early. I think we could see some movement there in the next week or two with Jackson Christian. Uh, could play out a little longer, but I, I'm not sure this one goes to late June. Well, let's talk about the linebackers a little more in depth. I know you kind of touched on them a second ago, Jerry, but I'll bring up the film and let you discuss. Yeah, so uh, Elijah Bards kind of got it kick-started with his recruitment last week, one of the top linebackers in the country, unbelievable kid. We had an exclusive interview with him on On Texas Football, which you can find. Uh, but then Riley Pettijon out of McKinney. Again, there's depth of really good players, some really top-end talent linebacker in the state this year. Riley Pettijon, 120 tackles there you see junior season. Uh, it's him and Elijah Barnes in state are the top two, and they have been for a while. Uh, you got love. You love starting a uh, huddle clip with a special teams play, by the way. Uh, but you know, then you have Jonathan Cunningham in state as well. So those are the three guys uh, that Texas is really uh, after in state. But there you see what I think makes Riley Pettijon really good, guys. He's a good space player. He can play. He can play in the box. He can play downhill. He can play in that mic position downhill, but he can also really run. He can play in space. He can cover. He has closing speed. That guy is a really, really hard worker. We had Nathan Daughtry on who trains him a while back, and you can go back and find that interview. But uh, he could he went on and on about Riley Pettijon and the work ethic he has. Obviously, Pettijon comes from a football family. His dad played at Syracuse, I believe. Uh, he's got FSU official visit. He's got USC uh, and Texas is sandwiched there, in there in the middle in June. Uh, but Texas has been a pretty good spot for Pettijon for a while, just like they were for Barnes. Uh, and we'll see how this plays out. But uh, Steve Sarkeesian, Johnny Nansen, they've given the same effort recruiting Riley Pettijon that they gave to Elijah Barnes. Uh, and then, you know, look, there's an out-of-state guy coming in this weekend that's one to keep an eye on as well, uh, guys, and that's Nasir White out of modern day. Nasir White, one of the more quiet recruitments, uh, one of the guys that doesn't talk as much to the media, kind of keeps it close to the vest. But, look, he is a different linebacker. He is a – there you see him playing off the edge. Bobby, he can really rush the passer naturally. He's got that closing quickness. He's got that natural pass rush feel and ability to him. Uh, so he's different than Barnes, than Pettijon. Not that Barnes can't do that, but the, he plays more exclusively in this spot for modern day. Uh, really plays off the edge there, as you see at that stand-up linebacker position. Uh, really, really good feet. Really explosive guy when he sees the football. Uh, so this is a big visit for Texas with Wyatt this weekend because, again, then we'll see if the official visit happens. Texas is going to take three linebackers in this class. Uh, that's what we do know. They're going to take three. They plan to take three linebackers. And so who will that third be? Uh, because they have Barnes, and you know uh, they're going to fight all the way on Riley Pettijon. And if they come out on top for Pettijon, who will that third linebacker be? And that's something to watch. But Nasir White coming in this weekend, uh, that that's big. Somebody's asking in the chat, does it help having Phil Samy with Pettijon? I think it I think it helps a little, but I don't think it's a game changer. Well, here, here's the other thing. It, don't forget about Jonathan Cunningham, too, right, yeah. out of North Crowley. So you add all these guys together. One of the things I was talking about last night on uh, the live stream with uh, Rod and uh, CJ guys is how rare of an in-state linebacker class this is. Um, a year ago, there were two linebackers in the entire state Texas really went after. Yep. There was, there was uh, Justin Williams, who ended up at Georgia. And there was Ty Anthony Smith, who ended up at Texas. That was it. And what we're seeing, this is the first year I can remember where Texas legitimately is really going after three linebackers in the state of Texas. Yeah. Jerry, they've gone out of state, like for Nasir, though near Sierra Whites or, or whoever. Um, I mean, just it, Leon so it, I mean, what whoever you want to talk about, the reality of it is, is that the state of Texas 
has not been producing many elite linebackers because of the style of offense I think the high schools play. I was going to say that, Bobby. That gets into a long conversation, which we don't have time for. But we will someday. But it, when Texas went to spread and everybody went to the spread, those guys that would have pl- traditionally played linebacker, they moved more to undersized edge to get after the quarterback. So Texas hasn't produced as many traditional linebackers in, the, I don't know, the last decade as a lot as some other states have. Um, or, so, the, or they play running back because they want to score yeah. more points. Yeah. The teams, yeah. Are, they play the teams like, like to win a high school game on, on Friday night, I got to score 40 points. Well, if my best linebacker prospect is going to be a better, is going to be a, a, the best running back on the team, let's just put him at running back. Yeah. We got to score points to beat people. Um, and so I, I think it's, I, I think that's one of the things, but this is a rare, to your point, this is a rare in state crop of linebackers at the highest level. Yeah, and we've had we've had a couple of those recently. Anthony Hill's uh, class as well. We went through a dry period there. I mean, it doesn't mean guys didn't go on and be NFL draft picks at linebacker, but for the Texas, uh, for an Alabama coming in, there just hasn't been as many of those guys. Um, and there's some really high end guys in the in the state this year as there was a couple of years ago. All right, y'all, we got a couple of super chats that we need to talk about real quick. This first one here from Taylor. Taylor said, and thank you, Taylor, by the way, bringing the family to first, to the first spring game. Any tips on where to park for the festivities? And while y'all give the tips here, I'm going to bring up this release from Texas that kind of tells you where some free parking is anyway. But any tips from you guys? So Look, I, I park on Dean Keaton and I pay to park on Dean Keaton on the side there because it's easy getting out. By the way, you're not in a parking garage. It's easy getting out, easy access back to 35. I tend to park there and just make the walk on over. But that's just one opinion. And that doesn't mean it's the right opinion. There are multiple places to park. I actually usually park south of the stadium. So uh, like uh, I would say, I think it's Trinity. It's where. It's beyond, just beyond where the old drum is. Um, and so there's a couple of different parking garages there. There's some street parking. Uh, for the spring game, it's different than, than regular games, too. So for regular games, that those areas are just lined with uh, tents and pregame parties and that sort of stuff. I don't think you'll see that for the spring game. Uh, so if you're looking at a, a aerial view or a map view, uh, I actually park... Uh, down the street uh, from the stadium. Actually, it's about, I don't know, five or six blocks away. There you go. And for those that are listening and not watching, complimentary parking courtesy of Texas Athletics is available for fans in the San Jacinto Garage, the Trinity Garage, the Brazos Garage, Speedway Garage, 27th Street Garage, Health Center Garage, and the San Antonio Garage, along with a couple of different lots as well. We have that information over on on TexasFootball.com, and you can go check it out there. So, and then our other Super Chat, fellas, is from Jay Lee. Thank you, Jay. Let's pretend Quinn Ewers did not come back and we're playing the same 2024 schedule. What would be your expectations under Arch Manning if he was a starter? I'll start this by the media, national media's expectations. 4,000 <laughs> yards, 45 touchdowns, no interceptions. Anything else is a failure. All right, go, Bobby. <laughs> you're, you're so right, which is the problem, you know. Uh, you know, I, I think that Quinn, uh, in his third year as a starter, should be worth a win or two at least, in addition to what um, a talented backup like Arch Manning would be worth, right? It's not like they're going from – um, I, you know, I want to say this the right way. Quinn's going to be an elite quarterback this year, in my opinion, right? So he's worth an extra win or two, even if you have all the pieces around him, even if you have a good quarterback. I don't think Arch is ready to be a great quarterback year one. I, I think that's putting too much on him. I, I do think he has the tools. I think Texas win, wins eight or nine with Arch, 10, 11, 12 with Quinn. That's kind of That's kind of my thought process there. All right. Well, we got lots of questions rolling in. Plenty of time to get your questions in, so please do so. But, Bobby, before we get to those questions, can you tell the folks out there about Factor? You know I can. I can do that, Blake, if you want me to. Uh, Eat stress-free this spring with Factor's delicious, ready-to-eat meals. Every fresh, never-frozen meal is chef-crafted, dietitian approved and ready to eat in just two minutes. Choose from a weekly menu of 35 different options, including 
Calorie Smart, Keto, Protein Plus. Uh, discover more than 60 add-ons each and every week. Uh, for example, this one of the things I like about Factor. Uh, for example, I'm on the I'm on the road this week, so I'm not at home. I can't uh, take those uh, meals on the road with me, or I won't take those meals on the road with me. So I can actually pause my subscription and still keep it up the very next week. Uh, you can get as get a 18 meals a week. You can get as little as six meals a week. Uh, so any way you look at it, they're all there for you. They have it any which way yeah, you need to get it. Get chef prepared meals on the table in just two minutes with factors ready to eat meals so you can get back to doing what you love this spring. No fat, no fuss, no mess. Uh, factor eliminates the hassle of prepping, cooking, or cleaning up. Uh, simply heat and savor the good stuff. Uh, again, head to factormeals.com slash Texas50 and use code Texas50 to get 50% off your first box plus 20% off your next box. That's code Texas50 at factormeals.com forward slash Texas50 to get 50% off your first box plus 20% off your next box while your subscription is active. Uh, I will say that it has made my lunchtime routine very, very easy when I'm working at home. We've had a lot of is SEC, Texas SEC yes. ready questions. <laughs> yes, actually we have. Uh, and... Is Texas SEC ready? I mean, we've had three or four people, I think, ask at least two or three. But here we go. King me. Is Texas SEC ready? I say absolutely. I think the fan base is SEC ready, too, or I hope you are. Um, but, yeah, no, I think Texas is SEC ready, right? They have uh, – it's three straight uh, top five classes. You're a blue blood in the portal. Uh, Sark has talked about it. And, look, Sark isn't one to just go up in front of the, the mic and BS. He's genuine. He feels like they have tremendous depth right now at Texas, and that's why you're going to see some really good players uh, hit the portal. Guys that are going to go start other places and be really good players. That's the type of depth Texas has. Um, is there is there a position or two where you'd like to have more? I think there always is. I mean, I think, I think Nick Saban last year had a couple of positions he wishes were more experienced or a little better. I mean – I, can't, I, I don't remember the last perfect roster in college football. I mean, I, Nick probably had one that was close, right? Um, Georgia may have on the on offensive and defensive lines and linebacker for a couple of years. But uh, I think Texas is SEC ready. I mean, if you line up all the teams in the SEC, who's who's more ready than they are? Hey, I Jerry, mean, I, here, here's, then, they all have warts except Georgia. And, and they Georgia's might. got to replace some receivers, but they do have some – I mean – I, I don't know. Uh, Georgia law. I, you know, Alabama lost a lot last year. Uh, in my opinion, they'll lose. They're losing a bunch. Uh, LSU looks like it should be good to go on offense, but their defense is in shambles right now a little bit. Uh, Ole Miss probably has the most, has the best chance to be an elite team they've had in a long, long time uh, under Lane Kiffin. But I, I think Texas is just as talented, if not more so than just about every team with the exception of Georgia. Now, the, the reality of it is, though, a lot of these teams, even the ones that are five and seven or six and six, like Florida, are really talented still. But, like, they're not uber talented. They right. don't have unbelievable players right now, but they've got some really good players that can cause you problems. Kentucky's even talented. I mean, Kentucky would be He's a so top smart. four. Hey, let's say this. Kentucky – would be a top four talent team in the Big 12 last year. Right, Jerry? Yeah. I mean, it, from an NFL perspective, they would be. Yep. So that yep. gives you a sense for how things change. At the same time, I think Sark's done a really nice job of adding pieces to the puzzle. And, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm excited about this season. Uh, Jerry, I want to go back, and, and pe a lot of people, we've got a 800 plus on YouTube, a thousand on or so on on Twitter this morning. I want to go back and reset something because, okay. like talking about SEC ready and all this stuff, one of those pieces that is that interior defensive line. And so, as uh, not, I don't know if everybody knows this, but Dominic Williams, uh, defensive tackle out of TCU, went into the portal. Texas is pursuing him. Uh, I want for people that weren't here at the start. Go back and, and kind of handicap that. Tell us where that situation yeah. is. How hard is Texas going after him, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, no, no question. Dominic Williams, uh, 
that went in the portal yesterday from TCU. Some Texas fans, if they paid attention to the interior D-line, remember he is a tremendous football player, a future NFL draft pick out of Mission Hills there in Southern California, went to uh, Bishop Alamany his senior year. He's in the portal. He's a guy that camped at Texas. Uh, had a real interest in going to Texas out of high school. Um, some of the bigger schools, the Blue Bloods, didn't follow through with offers at the time. He ends up at TCU, and he kicks some butt at TCU, and uh, now he's got a great opportunity. He's going to visit Oklahoma this weekend. I think he'll be at Texas shortly after that. There's been some chatter around USC with him. Uh, it wouldn't shock me if Oklahoma and Texas isn't where the decision came from with Dominic Williams, but we are in the NIL, NIL era. So don't just say that's 100% concrete. That's what Jerry said. I'm just saying it wouldn't surprise me, but we'll see what happens here. Uh, but I, Texas is all in on Dominic Williams. Make no mistake about it. He is – when they're – when Texas is looking at the guys who could enter the portal that were very, very good, this guy was on the list. Uh, he's, kind, a very, he's a very good zero tech player. Kind of handicap it for people. What's going on behind the scenes, like what you're hearing, uh, Texas, OU, any other teams, et cetera? Well, I mean, being at OU for the spring game, I mean, Oklahoma jumped on this one quick. I think there's been – there was some chatter last summer that he was possible to jump in the portal. That didn't happen. It did. I think his page is already off TCU, by the way. I mean, they zing that thing. Yes. <laughs> I tried, I tried, I tried, I tried to, Yeah. And I was like, God, they moved quick because it is gone. Gone. <laughs> so they were not happy about this one, right? And and look, because he's do, he would have dominated the Big 12 this year. I mean, and for people that say, well, how good is he really? Well, go back and look at Byron Murphy's first two years and what happened in year three, the jump he made. Dominic Williams is a future NFL player. Um, does he does he kind of remind you of Andrew Billings a little bit, maybe, Bobby? I mean, I don't know if he's maybe that level athlete three, four yards down the field, but he has that type of power, quickness and power combination, really good over the ball players. Um, look, I, I, I think Oklahoma is going to get that first crack. The key, the whole key um, with uh, with this is, if you if you go out if you visit anywhere, if I understand the, the the rule correctly, after asking a couple of people, and you sign an aid agreement, you're done with any other SEC school. Visits are over. So the key there for the people pursuing Dominic Williams is that he doesn't sign a grant and aid because some kid because college will say, oh, you can just sign this. It's you know not a letter of intent, right? Well, if you do, you're done with, this, with the other SEC teams. So that's going to be the key is, does can Oklahoma try semi get him to shut it down or can they not? Uh, but I, I think uh, Texas will meet with him. Um, o Oklahoma's meeting with him before the visit this weekend. I think Texas will meet with him before uh, the Oklahoma visit and ensure they get a visit. Hey, here's a uh, interesting question from Champ Bailey three. He says, "Why do you guys think that the defensive tackles are jumping into the portal more this year than previous years?" I think that it has to do with demand. They actually realize that there's a demand for them. A lot of it, right, Jerry? I mean, yeah. and I don't know that yet. I don't know yet that more are jumping in in total. Um, but I think that look there are certain positions like dbs don't tend to draw a lot in the portal right um but uh, the like in the nfl it's interesting so the nfl there's enough at every position just about to go around except for quarterback and left tackle okay but it, they also pay pass rushers in the nfl okay yeah. but in college football the positions that there aren't enough are of to really create 100 plus football teams that are competitive, one of them is defensive tackle, right? There's just not enough good ones to create good football teams. And so I think that in college football, I'm not so sure that that defensive tackle position isn't just as valuable as every other position other than quarterback. I mean, just think about that. There's a lot of good receivers out there. There's a lot of good offensive linemen out of there. Out there. There's not a lot of – just defensive tackles are harder to come by. And so I think that they can make a they can make a little bit more NIL. Yes. I can I always go back to this too. Go back and look at Clemson's two national championship teams. Um, you don't have you have to be good. It's kind of like 
basketball, you have to be good, not great on defense, but you have to be able to score the ball. But it's different. But this is what I'm saying. You have to be good on the offensive line, but you don't have to be great because RPO game, because tempo, you don't have to be dominant on the offensive line. If you are, it's a bonus. But go back and look at how Clemson won two national championships. One, they had a first-round pick at quarterback, right? They had NFL skill around it. But offensive line-wise, they didn't have any high draft picks. I think third or fourth round, they, Clemson had a first-rounder on the offensive line since 80 or 81. It's been over 40 years. But what they did was their D-line was dominant. So they – so while people – we look at – there's different ways to get the thing done and win the national championship. While you look at Bama and Georgia with the dominant front seven defensively, Clemson with a good, not great offensive line, won two national titles against those dominant defensive lines, but their dominant defensive line was just as hard for a better offensive line to deal with at Alabama. Uh, so it, you – the defensive line, you have to have really – I think the depth is going to be the key there. Um, I, I think there needs to be really good depth. You need a one war daddy front line guy, but I think outside of that, the depth is really big. I mean, Clemson rolled in six NFL guys on the D-line. And one other question, fella, from Layers of Snow. Do you want the last visit in the portal like in recruiting, or do you think the first visit is key here? Wow, that's a good question because the really good difference question. in the portal, hey, Jerry, in the portal, you can get them to shut it down and that's sign right. a letter, mm -hmm. right? right? Yeah. Whereas in recruiting, it's still there's a, still an end date. That's right. So um, it kind of goes back to what I was just saying. There's going to be pressure at, at, on Dominic Williams at OU this weekend to get that for Oklahoma to try to get that thing done, sign that grant and aid package, then it's over. He can't go to another SEC team. So definitely first visits, probably a little more favorable uh, in the portal era. But it doesn't mean the first team's going to win. It's just favorable. Uh, we have a couple of super chats we need to knock out real quick. This first one from Jack. Thank you, Jack, as always. He says, watching Bobby react to Jerry's Manscaped reading is worth a super chat. Should we do it again? <laughs> no. <laughs> Bobby's like, no. no. I can only handle one a day, Jerry. <laughs> He's nixing that one before it even begins. One a day. Oh, And then Edmund Lee. Thank you, as always, Edmund Lee, as well. He says, good morning. And Hookem from New Braunfels, back from my trip to Hamilton. Hey, that's right down the road from me, about 30 minutes. Texas will do well this inaugural SEC season, in my opinion. Sark's culture is alive and thriving. What a new start for on Texas football OGs. Hookem horns. Hookem, Evan. Hey, and we, we need to reset, too. I think that, uh, um, you know, look, we do expect uh, Texas to have a little more attrition in the portal. Um, and I do, I, I do think, uh, uh, I think we're looking Bobby linebacker. Yep. We can say linebacker, um, you know, not necessarily the names that people have heard there. Uh, but I think that the reality of it is, uh, is Texas at 85 scholarships with the most recent, uh, uh, attrition yesterday being Jamon Tapp. Texas has now got four guys in the, in the portal right now. That are on scholarship. Yeah. Okay. Uh, that was Jamon Tapp, Billy Walton, Peyton Kirkland, and Samaj Burrell. So that took Texas from 89 scholarships to 85. Obviously, Texas is recruiting people in uh, from the portal to Texas. We mentioned Dominic Williams. We've talked about Bill Norton, the defensive tackle out of Arizona. Uh, there may be more. Uh, we think there are going to be more, actually. Um, and so there's got to be some attrition to, to cut sideways on that. I'm thinking three to four more Longhorns currently are going to enter the, the portal. Uh, my number was always six to eight. They're at four right now. Um, I think that they could even go as high as eight, nine, ten kind of situation. But that will also give Texas an opportunity uh, to peel back and, and try to go after it. One thing I do want to say is Burt Auburn right now is not uh, counted towards that 85. He's not been on scholarship. I, it's my understanding he's still not going to be on scholarship because his uh, number that he's making in NIL exceeds his scholarship currently. Uh, so the kicker is doing really well there. And so that actually is a benefit of just being the University of Texas in that uh, you, you have a, 
a guy that's clearly a, a tremendous kicker uh, that you can, uh, you know, uh, he can be there without a scholarship, but be uh, getting uh, compensated via uh, NIL. So, uh, look, the Longhorns are in good shape here. I don't think that any of the, as of right now, I do not think any of the guys that are likely to go in the portal beyond what have gone in are going to cut too deep on this roster for 2024. And that's really one of the things, Jerry, you and I, Blake, CJ, and Rod have been have been monitoring. How deep does the cuts, how deep are the cuts? You know what I mean? Um, are they difficult to kind of absorb? Um, and as of right now, we're not hearing anything that's going to be extremely difficult to absorb. One other super chat, fellas, this one from Michael Schuler, And he says, I just wanted to give a big thank you to Bobby, Jerry, CJ, and Ron for yesterday. Looking forward to Saturday at the Victory Lab. Yeah, absolutely. We had everybody out to the posse. Not everybody. Obviously, not everybody could join. But uh, we had a little uh, get together yesterday at the Posse East in the afternoon. Just a, a friendly thing. Uh, thank you all for coming out. Thank you to some of our sponsors that showed up, uh, whether it was Joe Brown, Mark Saunders, uh, Jeff Clark over at uh, 40 Acres Collective. All of them uh, showed up, hung out for a little bit, uh, talked a little football. But Jerry got cornered on some basketball stuff for a little bit even. So it was a lot of fun. I mean, just uh, we enjoy doing that stuff. We're going to do it again at the Victory Lap on Saturday, um, 11 to 12. They have an indoor-outdoor area there. Uh, so if you're around, please stop by. If it's raining, we're going to be inside. If it's not, we'll be outside uh, with the big screen, uh, et cetera. But uh, we're excited. Please join us anytime you get an opportunity and, and stop on by and just say hi. Uh, happy to meet meet folks and uh, fellow Longhorns that uh, enjoy watching a little football. Hey, hey, Blake, um, I, before you bring up a Sandman's uh, super chat, uh, <laughs> somebody asked for the uh, – uh, I think it was E. Kim said, your, your, your perfect D-line class in 2025. Okay, so we're just talking about me here, right? Um, if I had four guys and you don't won't get these four guys, it never happens in recruiting like that. Even Kirby and Nick and, and Urban Meyer, they didn't get everybody. Uh, Brandon Brown, uh, Josiah Sharma, Zion Williams, and I, I'm a big Derry Norris as a fourth upside guy. Hey, Ed, if you'll send me your question normally, I'll fix your super chat. Don't worry about that. And Bobby, it is now time for you to tell folks out there about our newest sponsor. Yeah, really excited about this. Uh, with Mother's Day upcoming, uh, you may be like me, looking for the right gift for the right woman in your in your life. Make sure you check out the CarrotConcierge.com. Jody Reynolds is a personal jeweler. Jeweler, she is the Carrot Concierge. You can see some of her beautiful creations here. You can use the QR code on the screen uh, to see even more, or visit her on Instagram or her website, the CarrotConcierge.com as well. Jody's an Austin resident, a Texas fan. She and her family listened to On Texas Football. That's how uh, we got connected. Uh, she prides herself in providing personal service. She takes the extra steps to make sure your lady gets exactly what she wants. And because she doesn't have the overhead of a storefront, she often gets higher quality inventory at lower prices, as much as 30% less than what you'd see at a jewelry store. I recently ordered a piece myself for my wife for Mother's Day. It's a special bracelet that's really cool that has my daughter's name on it as well as my son's name on it. Uh, I thought that my, we're getting ready to be empty nesters, and so I thought that'd be cool for my for my wife on Mother's Day. Uh, Jody has a number of different tennis bracelets, rings, necklaces, uh, and more, all beautiful jewelry, all personalized for you and yours. Check out the, the carrotconcierge.com, visit her website, or give her a call or text and take care of that special someone in your life. Again, that's thecarrotconcierge.com. Thank you, Jody uh, and family. I feel like we're close to starting a second YouTube channel. It's like life skills. I mean, like we're doing a lot for relationships today, man. <laughs> I mean, look, we're trying to help everybody out here. You don't want my advice. Trust me, that is not good. But hey, talking I about Mother's Day. Help every, all the Texas fans out here. Jerry, talking about Mother's Day, two weeks ahead of time is a very big life skill, right? It's like talking about Valentine's Day more than a week out, especially, you know, I got to get reservations. If you try to get reservations that week, you're pretty much hosed. You got to get them at least a week out, right? Mother's Day, at least a week out, guys. We do what we can here at all. Yes. <laughs> Always trying to help, uh, Linda. Linda, helping hand. 
and it's not helping me. May 12th. That was the problem. It's not helping me. <laughs> it's not self help for you. It's just help for others. <laughs> Mother's Day, May twelfth, by the way. Uh, all right, guys, we have a couple of super chats, and I'm going to use that term very lightly. Uh, this first one here from Ed Blake. He says, I just wanted to say nice meeting Bobby, Jerry, CJ, and Rod at Posse East. Hook them. Thank you, Ed. Great we to meet you as well, Ed. And then, and then, well played here from Sandman23, Super Chat, he says, 99.99. Are we getting any traction with any potential Michigan players in the portal? Yeah, done deals, both of them. Thanks for your money. <laughs> <laughs> Jerry, we got to be, uh, let's be transparent here. Right now, we don't know if either of the defensive players that we would be talking about, the defensive tackles, uh, Mason Graham uh, or Kenneth Grant, are going in the portal. I, I was told it's less than 50 50 that either go in. Uh, so it, adjust your expectations accordingly, right? Yeah. So if that's the case, all this talk and discussion, if it's less than 50-50 that either of them go in, it's def definitely less than 50-50 either of them end up at Texas. So there you go. All right. And uh, here's a good question from Tom Doyle. How much will playing in all these SEC states help with recruiting? So it, that's a great question because I, this is one of the things that we talked about with the Alabama game last year that really stood out to me. The hardest state, for Texas to truly break through in right now is Georgia. Um, and that's because Georgia's on top of college football, whether they won last year or not, whether they won 40 or 41, I don't even know. I can't keep up. But then you have Clemson to the east. Then you've had Alabama with Nick. And Auburn is a massive threat in Atlanta area, as is Tennessee. So, And then you have the Florida schools to the south, FSU on the up with Norvell now, right? Florida, I don't know what it's about. But um, so either Florida – be ascend a little this year or they'll have a new coach. One of the things is going to happen. But in Ohio State really recruits the Atlanta area. Notre Dame, everybody recruits that area. So that's the hard, toughest state for Texas to break through in right now. So last year when Texas played at Alabama, there were more prospects from the state of Georgia at that game than any other state. Uh, and that's because there's a ton of talent in Atlanta Metro and South Georgia right now. So I do think playing in these states, because the one thing is it's been, it's all, it's been taught. Okay. Texas fans, we all get it. We're going to the SEC. It's going to be awesome. Right. But the SEC logo actually comes on next year and Texas starts playing East of the Texas state line. Uh, that is a big deal for me in recruiting, playing the university of Florida at Austin in Austin in 24 at the swamp in 25. That's big in recruiting. Um, does it mean you're going to get the player? No, but I, I expect the Florida pipeline to continue to be open. And it, it, Texas could put more resources there and get have more success. I really believe that. Um, so because there's so much talent all around that state uh, from the panhandle down to South Florida, which is maybe no man's land for Texas, but Southwest corridor up to Orlando, up to Jacksonville, across into the Pensacola. There's a lot of talent in Florida. So I do think playing in those states is going to help quite a bit. And being part of the SEC officially is going to be a big, big part. Of it. Now, I'll say this. If Texas goes and has a really good year, year one in the SEC, that, that takes you to another level. I, I, I go back to what you just what you talked about. Remember the, the Alabama game and all those recruits that were there. Yeah, that was by if, if you're from Atlanta or you're from Mississippi or you're from the state of Alabama, that was really your first introduction to Texas football. It, it really was. I mean, because they, yeah. they rarely would go past Louisiana, right, to, for for visits or to a football game. Texas walked into Bryant Denny and beat him. Yeah. Right in front of what 150 or so recruits that were there, most of whom are underclassmen. That'll pay dividends. It may not be like 10 guys, it may be just be one or two, but that may be all that Texas needs to bolster its class. Right. And that's, uh, I think, to Jerry's point, Georgia's is the state that has the most. And Texas might be able to do that along with Louisiana, along with Alabama, along with Mississippi. Just keep spot recruiting and finding guys that fit. 
The craziest thing is Mississippi's the tough, and we'll have time to get into all this, right? Uh, James Lee, great point. North of Alexandria is easier to pull kids out of state than south, and that is 100% true, even for Nick Saban and all those years at Alabama. Yeah, he got Landon Collins and the craziest recruitment you will ever, commitment you'll ever see on live TV, ever. Maybe the kid in Pensacola that I was part of was a little, that was just sad, but it wasn't as crazy as Landon Collins. Uh, but it, Nick Saban, he, he had more, much more success on I-20 than I-10 at Alabama. And that's even at Alabama. And James Lee's 100% correct. If you look at the history there and throw out Arch Manning, throw out Peyton and Eli, throw those names out. That's what not we're talking about here. We're talking about the average traditional recruits in Louisiana. Uh, New Orleans is tougher. Baton Rouge is tougher. But when you get up north in the Ruston, West Monroe, the West, most West Monroe kids go to LSU, Monroe, Neville, uh, most kids go to LSU, but it's easier on I-20 than I-10. That's just that's just the history of it. Uh, Mississippi, I think, is actually one of the more difficult states to recruit in because, I, Bobby, it goes back to the Chris Jones story we told uh, one time when I went down to Houston County to see Chris Jones when he was committed to Mississippi State when we ended up ranking him number two in the country before he really blew up. Um, in that state, they hide kids from colleges. No doubt they purposefully will keep assistant coaches from uh, neighboring schools from seeing these kids, talking to these kids. That is one of the more difficult states to get the really good ones out of. I I just completely agree. I'll just, I'll just say that. Uh, they don't, they, they don't, they'll, they'll not offer guys until later so that other teams, like, they won't even know who these guys are until October. That that's that's what they try to do. They play the late game. They don't let people know by offering them early who they really like. I mean, there was a story, whether it's true or not, it goes to the depths that uh, some people in the state of Mississippi will go to to keep these kids. There was a there was some chatter around the Chris Jones recruitment that a certain school East coach was pulled over for uh, and told to get back. <laughs> By Mississippi State police officer. <laughs> Go home. Uh, well, this has actually spurred a lot of conversation in the chat, fellas. A lot of people talking about the difference in the Big 12 to SEC schools visiting them. So let me ask you this, and let's hear from it from the chat, too. What's If you just had to pick one place, what's the one place you're most excited to going to in the SEC land? Um. For me, it's going to be LSU. Not I know that kidding. sounds weird uh, outside of AM. I mean, and I, you know, I thought about Georgia. I thought about Florida because uh, those are good football stadiums, good play. You know what I mean? Just like Alabama is a you know, great place to go uh, play a football game. But for me, Texas at LSU, uh, we got robbed of that with COVID, uh, obviously. Um, but I want to play at LSU at night. That's what I want to do. And see where where see where we where we come out because that place is supposed to be crazy. I've been to a night game at LSU, uh, but if the Longhorns were playing, I think it would be amped up a bunch. In Texas and LSU, frankly, they just don't play often enough to be neighbors. You know what I mean by that? It's like it's odd that we've played Arkansas and had this history with Arkansas and Oklahoma and a And M, but we've never had this like history with LSU. Why not? because they were in a different conference so long ago. Um, and uh, I would love to I would love to see that start happening. Of course, it's not going to happen in another in at least in two more years. So uh, but that's the one I'm I'm most interested in long term in the SEC. I think Auburn may have the most underrated home field advantage that nobody talks about because Alabama gets the attention. Georgia gets the attention. Uh, I think I think Jordan Hare is a great game experience on Saturday. I think South Carolina is very underrated too. Haven't been to a game there. Now that was in the Spurrier years, so that's different, right? When Marcus Lattimore and Jadavion Clowney and those guys are running around, that's a little different uh, when Spurrier's the coach. But I'll say, I think you, I think a game at the Swamp is really cool. Spurrier's got his sports bar there. Spurrier's there every day at some point. <laughs> so if you go in. For dinner, you might get to strike up a conversation with the old ball code. He does a podcast there. But the University of Florida is pretty cool. The Swamp's a great 
uh, home atmosphere. That's one of the coolest places too. I mean, on a day to day, like if you it, when Texas plays at Florida, if you get there a couple of days early, the st- swamps open from nine to five every day. You can go in there. You'll see students working out, running stairs. You'll see students just hanging out, uh, just studying or whatnot. That that's a pretty cool place to go to because Spurrier's Bar and Grill, uh, the swamp, and then you could just go in and hang out there if you want. Uh, the day before the game and just really take it all in. So that that's a pretty cool one for fans, I think. All right. And lots of people weighing in too. So lot, lots of good answers. Great call. What about you, Blake? What do you think? Man, I was sitting there thinking, I'm kind of with you, Bobby. LSU, and not only for football, but for baseball too. Ole Miss for baseball. Um, but for football, I, I think it's going to be LSU is going to be my answer. I just I've never have been there. Um, but – We'll see. We'll see what happens. Good stuff. What about basketball, Jerry? Is there like a basketball? I know Kentucky is going to be the obvious SEC answer for basketball, but is there any others like that's on a basketball wish list? Yeah, you know, that's a, that's a good question. Um, I'm not sure there really is. I mean, uh, Tennessee's got a great uh, – it's underrated. They have a great following for men's and women's basketball. I mean, they really do. Uh, That's probably a really good home court to go to. Arkansas, obviously, especially if Texas is playing there. I mean, now it's going to be Texas playing at Arkansas with John Calipari. So that's probably a great one to go to, honestly. That's going to be some vitriol and hate, and you're going to get your neck spit on the whole game. Uh, So that's a good one. Uh, But uh, by the way, if, if you haven't seen it, go find it on social media. The best new head coach introduction I've ever seen was Mark Pope at Kentucky. If you haven't seen it, there's a three- or four-minute video. They sold out the arena for the coach introduction. Not a seat in the house. They rolled in the Kentucky Athletics bus onto the onto where the court would be. And, and then before Pope got off the bus, about 60 former players, ex-NBA players, Kentucky greats, all this, all exited the bus before him. It is one of the coolest things I've ever seen in college sports. They did an amazing job with that. You think they care about basketball in Kentucky, maybe? I think they might. <laughs> <laughs> if you haven't seen that, go find that video. That was really well done by Kentucky and really cool. Well, guys, we got time for a few more questions here before we get out of here. But first, Bobby, can you tell folks out there about Rick Vavro and Austin Underground? Yeah, Rick's been a real, uh, uh, a real uh, supporter of uh, on Texas football and coffee been football uh, on uh, for us. Uh, we appreciate him so much. Uh, Rick and his team since two uh, since two thousand and four uh, have been specializing in difficult underground commercial installations. Uh, the team's engineering background at Austin Underground gives them the ability to perform work other firms often consider too risky. Rick and his team offer an end-to-end client experience, including seamless communication, budgeting, staffing, and top-notch trade port partners. And most importantly, they produce solid quality work each and every time. Thank you to Rick Vavro and his team at Austin Underground, as well as Texas Road. If you have some road uh, work you need done uh, on a private level. Uh, Rick and his team always there for you as well in the Austin area. Hey guys, I want to I want to go from here and go straight into something that was written on uh, ESPN yesterday. Uh, I don't know if y'all saw this or not, Blake. If you could try to find that and bring that up, uh, Stark was quoted uh, yesterday, Jerry and Blake, uh, about uh, his interest or how he was contacted about the Alabama job, et cetera. By any, and you talked to ESPN exclusively about it. He said that, look, I entertained it for about first the first 60 seconds. I mean, who wouldn't if somebody like that calls? He goes, he, he, but he enjoyed his two years at Alabama. But he said, look, I'm a big believer in you reap what you sow. And right now, I feel like we're on the cusp of being an elite team. And why not sit back and actually enjoy the fruits of our labor? Uh, it was a very astute answer in my opinion, uh, a strong one and a, it was more of a come join us uh, type halcyon call, not only to fans, but to players and recruits alike. He's like, look, we're on the precipice of something special here. Blake, you have it. You want to put it up now? Naturally, I'd be lying if I said I didn't think about Alabama, Sarkeesian, Tolia, PM, but it took me 
all of 30, about 60 seconds to say, yeah, I'm not doing that. I had an awesome two years at Alabama and loved my time under Coach Saban. But ultimately, you want to reap what you sow. Blake, if you read the next, if you'll go to the next paragraph. Yes, down. Give me just a second here. I'm pulling it up. If my computer will cooperate here. Here we go. And we poured a ton into this program for three years. And we're on the cusp, I think, of going on a run that will be epic. I believe that. Our staff does. Our players do, too. Just the support we have and the culture we've created here. Why leave something like that? We're on the cusp. I, I, that's the, that's the, re, the repeat that. We're on the cusp of something epic. That's, that's, where, that's where Sark thinks we are right now in this situation. So I, I thought that was a good one. We wanted to mention that this morning before, uh, before we get out of here uh, for this hour of coffee and football. Yeah, good stuff for sure. I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, we've had this question asked a couple times. And I just haven't got to get to it. So, Jerry, I'm going to ask you. He said, and from Gary Smallwood, are you con concerned that we lose Lance Jackson to pro baseball? So he's missed a lot of the season. He should be back either this week or next week, based on what he told me a couple weeks ago. Uh, with the sprained AC joint from Under Armour Camp when he was out there dominating everybody at the Under Armour Camp in Houston in mid-March. Uh, so he got a sprained AC joint, nothing major, but it did keep him off the bump for uh, a while there. So he hasn't got the pitch much yet. He, he closed three games out. He had one start. Um, so he hasn't had he hasn't had a lot of mound time this year. If if it gets into the danger zone, it won't be this season. Although they're a tremendous team, multiple guys going to major universities, scouts at every game. I think it would be, well, how does he look this summer? I, I, but I think things are leaning more to football. Uh, than baseball to spot him throwing 95, 93, 95 miles an hour. But that could change this summer. Hey, what about right that now, injury? Does that shoulder injury kind of – I think it's a shoulder injury, right? Yeah, does that kind of throw baseball a little bit? Yeah. Yeah, does that, that, doesn't that kind of throw baseball in, in flux a little bit? Um, yeah, I think – but he's supposed to be back on the mound next – for the playoff run, last part of district and playoff run. So he should be back. Um, it, it's very minor. It was more precautionary. Than anything, not something that could it would he could have played he could if it was football he'd have played through it. If it was senior year of baseball, seven games left, I think he'd have played through it. Uh, but I think this was more precautionary. And I just I want to add in that uh, he is ranked in the top five hundred uh, nationally by a perfect game. He's ranked number five hundred, um, and then he was also named to the twenty twenty four perfect game preseason underclassmen All American team this year but not a lot going on on his perfect game profile at the moment as jerry said obviously the injury maybe. but the, the, the 500 was that like a 15th round draft pick yeah so the fear for texas with that it's a legitimate fear he's 6'6 26 he's a big time athlete he's an intelligent kid and he throws 95 i mean that's an investable athlete that pitches right uh so there is there's some risk there uh, for sure. Uh, but look, that's how talented of an athlete Lance Jackson is. You're, that's just part of the game. Uh, Horn 7, what does Jerry mean by more resources in Georgia? I mean, more money spent with feet on the ground than recruiting there. Meaning, you know, all these trips cost a lot of money. Uh, whether you're, you know, flying, flying out, if you're using a, a jet or wherever you're going, the more time spent in Georgia, the more money you're putting into having coaches recruiting in Georgia, flying in there, going from school to school, seeing people. And that's less time spent in Texas or Florida or some other areas. That's the that's the decisions that have to be made. It's an opportunity cost. Yeah. And the only the one thing you can't get back if you're a, a, a Texas coach is time. Yeah. So if you're go if you're at one place, you can't be somewhere else. And so when, when we talk about resources, I know exactly what Jerry meant by that. It's like, look, we've got two guys down, Kenny Baker and Tashard Choice, that yeah. know Georgia. They're from Georgia. That's more resources. That, that, they're not, there's not resource, more resources going to, I don't know, Illinois, right? But it will take some time away from Texas. It'll take some time away from maybe Louisiana. I mean, you, just, you don't know. And our next question, guys, Jerry, they want to put you on the spot, living rent-free, and you oh, over under two commitments this weekend. Ask me again tomorrow. Let me check and see if a couple, three guys are actually going to show up this weekend. 
Ask me that tomorrow. Right now, I'll take even to under. But I'm waiting to see uh, if two or three guys may show up this weekend that could change that. By the way, um, I do have – I did get a text back during the show. Uh, Jordan and Devin Coleman will not be in this weekend. There we go. And one other over-under question, this one from Naaman Roberts. Over-under, four, four offensive linemen entering the draft in 2025. What do y'all think? Well, Majors will, Banks will. So he's talking would, DJ Campbell and, and Cam Williams. I would say under. I would definitely say under based on that. Jerry? Right? I mean, what, Jerry, do you think both Cam Williams and DJ Campbell enter? No, I think I, see I, DJ I, Campbell. Uh, I, I don't know that. I think, I, they, I think they're both going to need another year. I do too. But but let's see how they, let's see how Cam Williams plays this year too, Jerry. Yeah, you know, let's see how he plays. All right, and then let's see here. Speaking of the O line, Zane Petty says, "What do you guys expect the starting O line to be for the spring game?" Uh, left to right, I expect. I expect it to be Kelvin Banks, Hayden Connor, Jake Majors, uh, DJ Campbell, Cam Williams. Now, the <clears> second <throat> time, the second time they go out there, I expect it to be Kelvin Banks, Nato Umiozulu, Hayden Connor at center, uh, Cole Hudson at right guard, and then uh, 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 Cam Williams still at right tackle. And, and I think I think what's interesting, something to follow here is. Um, with the offensive line this during the season is if Texas is more two back, runs the ball a little bit more, I think that could impact a couple of offensive line decisions this season. I'll just say that. That makes sense. I mean, because I, I, they look, Hayden Connor may be better in pass protection than NATO right now, but NATO may be better, a more dominating offensive. Uh, I may, maybe more Cole Hudson may be better. Yeah. In the run that, game than Hayden Connor. That's correct. So there, there's two different options there. This next question, gone, kind of going back to the whole Lance Jackson conversation, Bo Tex knows, says, do you think Sark would be open to his players playing multiple sports? I, really I think hard to do. It's hard to do, but I do think uh, football, baseball, football track is possible. Um, I, I think it's hard to do, but look, as much as Steve Sarkeesian loves speed, if Marquise Goodwin had a little brother that was coming out right now, he's not turning him down. <laughs> I, I mean, he's not. So there's levels to it, right? If Lance Jackson ends up at University of Texas and he is a potential first round pick as an edge prospect, as an edge prospect in the NFL draft, I don't think Sark says, "I know, no, no chance. You can't go throw the baseball over here a little bit in the spring." until you decide that football's where your future is. I don't think he's going to do that uh, because I do think uh, it, there's levels to how t special a talent is that, you, that you'll make the adjustments for. I'll say that. Hey, think about Jamal Charles. Mac pushed on Jamal Charles being part of spring ball, and because of that, I think Jamal Charles left a year early at Texas. Yeah. He's back wanting to give up, give up track to concentrate on football in the spring. I think that's one of the reasons why Jamal left early. So you, you don't, you, you want to be, you, know, you want to give up. How, how, how many yards would Jamal Charles rush for in another year? Yeah. You don't give up on those uh, guys that are dual sport guys that are legitimately great players in the other sport are great. I mean, Jamal is one. I mean, Marquise Goodwin's an Olympian for goodness sake. That, that's a different category than maybe some guys that are just participants in another sport, the backup right fielder. That's not what we're talking about here. Yeah. No. You know, we're talking about a guy that has a, a legitimate chance to be a, a pro athlete in another sport. Okay. This will be the last question for today. This one from King me. He says, how do you guys feel about players having unlimited transfers? I don't like it without penalty. I think you should get one transfer reset. I think after that, I'm not for multiple, multiple transfers with no time sitting out. I, I, I think that is a major issue in the portal for me. I think you should get one freebie, and, and after that, think longer 
and harder about the decision. There's, I mean, it can't, it can't stay this way. I, there's just, I, I just don't see how it can stay this way long term. And I know coaches are well paid. I get it. I know coaches leave. I get it. But I mean, there's some dings being taken right now around college football that to me shouldn't, they just shouldn't be getting hit with guys on the transfer the second time. Bobby? I, I'm i fine with uh, the way it is now. I don't have a problem with it. I mean, until or unless these players are treated uh, – the, the problem I have with it actually is actually on the players themselves. I'm worried they're not advancing towards their actual degrees, right? It's not about the playing time that they get somewhere else or being part of something. I do think there's a little bit to that, but I'm fine with – being able to transfer as as you see fit, as long as you're advancing towards your degree, man. I mean, a lot of these guys that are transferring a bunch, unless you're actually like wanted in the portal, like heavily wanted by a big time program, you're most likely not going to go make money playing in the NFL. OK, so you need to be advancing towards your degree to even be able to transfer, in my opinion. So that that would be my issue there. Okay, hey guys, well, we've had a lot of people join us. I know we need to get out of here, but let's real quickly recap yep. the news of the day. Uh, obviously, a lot going on. The team back on the field today, players meet with the media after that. But there's also a lot going on off the field with recruiting and the portal. Can you give folks the rundown? Yeah, so I think Dominic Williams is the big news, the defensive tackle that went in the portal from TCU. Texas is all in here. Oklahoma's all in here. I expect him to visit both places as of today. He's scheduled to be at Oklahoma this weekend. He's a guy that Texas really, really wants. So people have been wondering, when's a D lineman going to hit the portal Texas really, really wants? Dominic Williams is that guy at TCU. He's a big-time player over the ball in that zero, that tilt position. Uh, he's one of the best in the country returning. So that's big news. Bill Norton official uh, is going to make his visit this weekend. Another guy that plays can play that over the ball, had 178 snaps in the A-gap last year. He's visiting Texas this weekend, obviously played for Johnny Nansen, was a teammate of Savea last year on a 10-win Arizona team. So he'll be in this weekend, and we'll see. I mean, more guys are starting to jump in the portal. I think You'll see more names after these April 20th spring games. Uh, but I do think Dominic Williams was the first big one that I've seen jump in the portal that Texas is like, oh, yeah, there's a guy. And they're battling Oklahoma on him right now. There may, there may be a couple others, uh, but right now it feels like Texas and Oklahoma are really going to swing at each other on this one. We'll see what happens. Okay, and – that's going to pretty much do it for today's episode of Coffee and Football presented by Rick Valbro and Austin Underground. We want to thank them for sponsoring today's show, along with Factor, Manscaped, and Carrot Concierge for helping us out today. And uh, thank you all for the Super Chats for tuning in. We definitely appreciate that. Head on over to ontexasfootball.com. Become an OTFOG. Bobby, give them the spill on that because we didn't really plug that today if they haven't already become one. Yeah, absolutely, uh, Blake. Uh, so the carry, I, uh, the the OTF OG is a premium subscription. We started about a week and a half ago. We've had hundreds of people sign up. We appreciate that. Uh, we're right now giving people twenty dollars off the annual subscription. It's going to be regular fifty nine ninety five. But if you want to be an OTF OG, all you have to do is use co coupon code OTF OG when you check out, and that then you get twenty bucks off, and it becomes thirty nine ninety five annual. We wanted this to be a subscription price where everybody could join if they wanted to and, and come in and be with us. Uh, this is where we're at when we're not on video or talking to you here or talking to coaches or who are players, recruits, et cetera, uh, reporting on the news and notes. But uh, please join us at ontexasfootball.com. That's O-T-F-O-G is the special code, just $39.95 a year. Uh, we appreciate you. Blake, I wanted to make – we've had a couple of basketball yeah. questions. There's some high hopes for Jordan Pope who is on campus, the point guard from Oregon State, the transfer. Uh, we'll see what happens there, but there's some high hopes in Austin there. But, uh, again, we'll see what happens. He'd be a big one. I love, I'm, I'm going to Dirty's today for lunch, by the way, guys. Dirty Martins. I'm Go ready. I'm in Austin. I'm back in, in, the, in the crew. I'm in the groove. <laughs> All right, well. We will be back same place, same time tomorrow morning. And for Bobby Burton and Jerry Hamilton, I'm Blake Monroe, and we'll see you.